I think it's worth the applause because Diana has been coordinating two quite successful campaigns to stop coal power plants here in Poland. Um, and she, it is said she's one of the top leaders of the most significant Polish campaigns for climate and climate uh, justice. And uh, Diana, you're working um, at the Association Workshop for All Beings, and right now you will be guiding us through this discussion and exchange on energy, energy security and giving this European perspective. But you will not be doing this alone. <laughs> but uh, we have a guest and he will be joining us online, Jakob Dalude. Is he already there? Can we see him already? Jakob Dalunde. I'm having a look at the technique at the back. There he is. Jacob, Jakob, a warm welcome here from Warsaw. Thank you so um, much. Jakob is a member of the European Parliament for the Swedish Green Party. In the European Parliament, he's dealing, um, he's a member of a committee working on transport, tourism, industry, and energy. And I think we're especially interested in the energy question here. Jakob, you were also a spokesman of the youth organization of the Swedish Greens and a member of the Riksdag like the Swedish parliament. And you will give us now um, a European perspective on um, energy security. And with saying that, I will hand over to you, Diana. Okay, wonderful. I hope it works. Uh, so once again, uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and hello, Jakob. Uh, happy to, to see you. Um, I believe we can start because we don't have uh, that much time. Uh, during this debate, um, I would like to ask you uh, a few questions uh, concerning uh, the challenges of the European energy transformation in the context of uh, the war in uh, Ukraine. As uh, many challenges we had already uh, been facing uh, due to the climate crisis um, now have been greatly exacerbated. And I believe we all understood how vulnerable we are as an economy um, to, to global crises, not only uh, the climate crisis. And um, I would like to ask you about the European uh, response to, to this crisis. Um, how uh, the EU uh, can um, address it while aligning its response to what we believe are the European values. So uh, solidarity, climate protection, human rights, uh, the rule of law, uh, and of course, uh, security. And, and what is your vision, uh, the vision of the Greens in the EU Parliament? Um, what kind of solutions uh, we, should, uh, we should use and how you can be an actor in this process. Uh, but my first question um, concerns security in general because uh, the war, um, I think, forces us to reevaluate our understanding of security. Um, does the EU... Uh, adapt its understanding of security to the new reality? Uh, is it still only about the um, security of supply or uh, perhaps uh, more about energy independence? And if so, whether it should be an independence at European level or, or national level, or perhaps the uh, understanding of security uh, goes further? For example, to um, providing the citizens to affordable energy. So yeah. Uh, thanks, questions. Diana. And uh, that's uh, quite a lot of very big questions. And I will try to do my utmost to uh, address them. And it also feels very good to be able to join this uh, conversation. Usually, we Greens are in the position that we have to be sort of the bringer of, of bad news towards consumers or citizens that we are saying, well, we have to take care, we have to do these things that also have some other byproducts. Um, that, well, we need to re reduce the, way, the amount of meat that we eat, and that feels maybe boring 
for those who like to eat meat, or we have to drive less cars, and that is bad for those who like to drive cars, or we, we need to reduce, reduce the amount of uh, aviation, and that's bad for those who like to go for summer breaks in the other parts of the world. But in this very, st very instance, it's actually the quite unusual case that what we have been pushing for for a very long time, the transition to renewable energy, is, is actually perfectly aligned with what we need to do in order to stop uh, funding the Russian war of aggression uh, on, on not only Ukraine, but actually uh, Europe in its entirety. Because we as Greens, uh, not only in, in, in Poland, but also in other member states, such as Sweden, we have been saying this for decades. When, when Russia started to use energy as not only a source of revenue, but also as a geopolitical weapon, we have been opposed to this. Take, for example, the, the pipelines to the Baltic Sea, Nord Stream 1 and 2, that is something we as Greens in Sweden and the European Parliament strongly opposed not only because it would lead to cheaper fossil fuels in, in Europe, which would then be burned, causing climate uh, disruption, but also because the revenues that, that European consumers would pay would go directly into the Russian state-owned company Gazprom, which funds the Russian war machine. So. When I was defense policy spokesperson, trying to, in, in, in the Swedish politics, trying to discuss to what extent should we increase the funding of the Swedish military, it felt a bit stupid that the need to expand the Swedish military was because we were paying for the Russian military. So not only did we fund the military, we also had to uh, fund the Russian military. We also at the same time, because of that, had to at the same time spend more money to pay for our own military because Russia had an increasing ability to threaten its neighbor because we were paying the salaries of those soldiers and that military equipment. So for a very long time, we have been saying we need to stop purchasing fossil fuels from Russia and instead um, expand renewal, renewables for climate reasons, for security reasons, but also for health reasons. So there have been very many opportunities for us to try to do so. And now when the uh, Russian um, aggression has been increasing uh, with the events beginning in, in February, we now have some, some difficult choices to make. The, the energy prices in Europe started to increase even before the war of aggression because Russia started to reduce the exports of fossil gas as a measure to show European citizens and politicians that they, that is something that they could do. It was, a, it was a show of force that don't try to intervene in our uh, increased aggression towards Ukraine, because if you do, we will cut, we, we can cut uh, exports. So don't do that, because that would then, from the Russia perspective, lead to social unrest um, in Europe. The problem, though, is that in many, many parts of Europe, Sweden, for example, and, and very many other member states, the, the national response to that was not, okay, let's increase with expanding renewables. Let's increase the expansion of energy efficiency measures. Let's support our citizens in um, insulating the homes, uh, heat pumps, other measures to combat that um, Russian usage of energy supply as a geopolitical weapon. That is unfortunately not what we did uh, half a year ago. Instead, there was a lot of um, government measures to support the citizens in helping citizens paying for that um, higher energy bills. I can, of course, understand politically why 
that was done because if it wouldn't have been done, that would have led to difficulties for the governments all over Europe. But it's still a very short-sighted measure. What we should have done is maybe do a little bit of supporting the citizens in paying the higher energy bills, but at the same time, ten doubling the efforts in helping citizens reduce their energy consumption in general, but also at the same time increasing renewables. Some production of renewables is, of course, very long term. Building a new offshore wind farm, that is not something that you do from one year to the next. It's longer time for that. But there are a lot of things that we can do in the short term, especially um, solar panels. If we would have a European program um, supporting citizens in installing thousands, if not millions, of solar panels on the roofs of our houses, our factories, our offices, if we would have supported uh, changing the windows so, so that uh, our houses don't leak energy and, and uh, helping our citizens installing heat pumps, that would have strengthened us uh, for the winter that will come now in six months and, and, and making us less vulnerable to, to Russia. That is something now that the European Union is doing a little bit with the Repower EU package. And that is, of course, a welcome package, but it is far too small. It should be much, much bigger. And we should be doing everything that we possibly can in order to make us less vulnerable to a complete shutdown of uh, exports from, from, uh, from Russia. Mm. Now, currently, the export from Russia has been cut by two-thirds, so it's actually only one-third of the normal exports that is going to Europe. Um, and it is possible that either we from the European side will finally have the courage to say no to all import, or Russia will take that decision and try to cause political and social unrest in Europe by cutting the exports on their side. Regardless of which route we will take, I'm certain that it will not be far off until we have no exports. And to prove Putin wrong, that that decision, whether it's his decision or her decision, that that decision will not call, cause social and political unrest in Europe. In order to not prove uh, Putin wrong, we need to do much, much more to protect us from that. Mm -hmm. Fossil fuels, um, especially gas, um, have become the center of the debate about the uh, energy in Europe uh, right now because of the war. Um, in Poland, um, for many years, uh, the energy independence, uh, energy security um, was uh, have been perceived as independence from Russia, especially in terms of gas. Uh, mm, but it was to be achieved uh, not by the gasification, but uh, by uh, importing gas from other, um, other suppliers. So uh, just changing the dealer instead of fighting the addiction. And um, we see uh, this alarming tendency uh, to follow this path uh, in the EU. Many uh, fossil, uh, many gas projects uh, which uh, had been previously scrapped um, are now being uh, revived. Uh, many new are proposed, like LNG terminals, um, many um, gas power plants. It's especially visible uh, in Poland. And uh, the discussion seems to be uh, steered away uh, from uh, leaping past gas and investing in other other solutions, rather do this ad hoc solution of just changing uh, the supplier. So uh, where, in your opinion, does EU stand and um, how we can change this direction, if it's really so? Well, 
Unfortunately, I, I would say that the European answer is, I would say, 50% good and 50% bad. If you look at the repower uh, package um, that is supposed to help us deal with this, there are some good things in it, such as supporting the expansion of energy measures and renewable energy. That is good, of course, but there's still a lot of bad things as well in it, such as, as you mentioned, the expansion of LNG terminals. And, I mean, I can understand that it is, to some extent, difficult for policymakers all over Europe to, to not shut down all the fossil power that we have, both in terms of coal, oil or gas. I mean, I fully well know that we should have had zero emissions a decade ago. That would have been the best thing for the climate. But that is just not politically or, or socially possible. So we cannot shut them down from one day to the next. Um, but I don't think that we should expand the terminals, uh, increasing our future reliance on imports of LNG. That is both bad for the climate, but it is also a waste of money. Every euro, whether it's private euros or, or public euros, or slotis for that matter, is, is really a waste. We need to spend every available euro or sloti on supporting the, the, what is actually sustainable, which is renewables and energy efficiency measures. So um, if the Greens, if we have our way, nothing, not a single euro or sloti, to expansion of LNG terminals. Instead, we should help citizens put solar panels on the roofs, installing energy pumps, uh, insulating their homes, uh, changing the windows, uh, working together in, in villages of, of should we cooperate and put up a windmill and own that together, creating energy communities. We need to look at creating the links between energy markets. I mean, one of the problems with renewable energy is that it's intermittent, meaning that on some days the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine, there isn't water in the magazines for hydropower. But every day in some part of Europe the sun is shining and the wind is blowing and there are water. So if we create more links where we can transmit energy between our markets, that makes benefits for renewable energy. In Denmark, for example, they, they have built so much renewables, especially wind power, uh, wind power, that on many days of the year, they produce so much energy that they can't even sell it because there's not enough connections to the neighboring states. They actually would pay to be able to get rid of the energy because they have nowhere to put it. And as long as the windmills are turning, you need to do something with en that energy. And they would be willing to pay Germany to get rid of that energy. But Germany does not accept that uh, to a full extent. So we need to uh, make more cables between our member states. And Poland has a fantastic potential, especially for uh, offshore wind power. I, I can imagine that in some parts of, of the rural communities and in cities that, that you don't want to destroy the views and you don't want to put windmills everywhere. I mean, I think windmills are beautiful and actually make the countryside better, but, but in, in some parts of uh, our member states that is not the case. But offshore is, is a fantastic uh, opportunity for producing renewables and it's, it's also a good opportunity to sell it to your neighbors. So if we would have more links between um, Sweden, Denmark and Finland towards Poland uh, with more uh, opportunities to sell and, and buy energy and link those up with uh, offshore wind farms uh, on the Baltic coast, uh, kilometers away from the from the beaches so that you couldn't even see the, the, the windmills even with a, uh, a binocular. Uh, that is uh, what I would propose and the Greens in the European Parliament, Parliament are proposing to do instead of 
switching the reliance of fossil gas away from Putin, but instead buying it from uh, dictatorships in other parts of the world and still destroying our climate. So um, I can understand that you propose security as the uh, energy independence from other regions of the world, uh, understood as uh, independence within the EU, uh, with all interconnectors and so on. And uh, this brings me to, um, to my next question. Uh, because you mentioned windmills, you um, you mentioned uh, I mean wind turbines, <laughs> turbines and and renovation. Um, unfortunately, as far as I know, Poland is the um, second to the last country in in the EU in terms of energy efficiency, which on the other hand is it's really sad. But uh, on one hand, quite sad. But on the other hand, uh, it gives us huge opportunity because there is so much to, uh, to do, so, so much we can achieve. And you also mentioned the offshore wind. Uh, as long as it is uh, preceded by really thorough environmental impact assessment, it can absolutely be done. And I agree with you. Uh, but here um, comes my, my other question, because uh, Poland uh, has been infamous in the EU um, due to its problem with the rule of law. And not only, with the human rights and, and many other uh, things. It's, it's not only the case of, of, of the judiciary system, um, but also how the citizen rights are being limited, uh, for example, when it comes to participation in environmental protection, um, the access to information, to the environmental impact assessment procedure. And uh, what worries me um, is uh, a prospect of, uh, um, of the European um, authorities uh, being more lenient and accepting the uh, problem, problems uh, with the rule of law, sacrificing the rule of law, uh, for example, to, um, to provide us uh, with more money uh, for, the, um, for renovation, for, for fighting with, um, with uh, energy poverty uh, caused by the energy crisis, uh, and to accept our national recovery plan without any deep changes to, to, to our law. Uh, so, um, what is, what is the um, the position? What is going on in the European Parliament right now uh, when it comes to uh, such issues? Not only in terms of Poland, but also other countries. So, so the Green Group in the European Parliament, we are of course very strong on on this issue. Uh, we are uh, every week pushing the Commission to be much more strict towards the Polish government uh, when it comes to uh, rule of law, human rights, um, gender, uh, and, and so on. Uh, not only Poland, but also uh, Hungary. However, too many of our political colleagues from the other groups um, do not favor uh, that very uh, strict uh, method. They, they, they don't want to do more of a balancing act um, in terms of not uh, pushing uh, the Polish government too far. There, there is some discussions of a risk of if we push the, the, the Polish government too far that they will um, make some kind of either uh, fake referendum or, or even just uh, unilaterally try to leave the European Union, which would, of course, be very difficult politically in this uh, geopolitical um, and, and environment. I mean, we in the Greens, we think that that risk is over, overblown and that it's really worth it to be as strict as possible uh, with both the Polish government and the Hungarian government. Um, we, but I think we also need to find some ways of not the, having the economic support directly linked to the Polish government, but also see if we can work with local and regional governments um, that are not as uh, 
uh, how to say, culpable with the abuses towards the human rights situation and the judicial situation. Um, that is not some. That is not a policy area that I am personally uh, working on. So, um, some other colleagues uh, in the European Parliament, other than me, are, are better wor uh, versed in how to handle those political instruments um, in a better way. But, uh, but, but uh, ideologically, that is something that we that we are, are, are trying to do. But what I what I also think is is important is that we uh, in the in the European Green um, family in the EGP um, and supporting events like this and by that also supporting the, the Polish Greens because in the end we cannot only solve these issues with pressure from outside of Europe uh, outside of Poland it also uh, has to be in conjunction with pressure from within uh, Poland. And in that pressure, the Polish Greens are Poland's best hope, not only in terms of environment and climate, but also in terms of democracy, human rights, and the, the rule of law. So uh, that is, of course, not something that, that you guys need to, to hear from me. You, you know that fully, fully well yourselves. But I, I, I just want the Polish Greens to know that we Greens outside of Europe are, we see what you're doing and, and we are so thankful for the tireless fight that you are trying to do. And, uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm Green in a, in a country where it is in many ways so much easier to be Green. Uh, in terms of logistics, in terms of societal climate. So for me, sometimes it's difficult to, to be green, but if I compare that to, me, to some other member states, it's, it's a walk in the park. So um, I, I just want you to hear those, those words of encouragement, not, not only how important the work that you're doing is, but also that we realize how difficult it is and how much in need of, of our support you are given the, the limitations that you face in terms of the political landscape and climate uh, in your country. Thank you very much for these kind words. Uh, I believe we all agree that to, to provide uh, Europe with, with security, with energy security, we can't sacrifice uh, climate or uh, the rule of law and other va values uh, such as human rights. And uh, there is something very concerning uh, for me, which is connected with Repower EU and the approach of the European Union to, um, to for example, hydrogen. Uh, I recently learned from my, um, from my Ukrainian colleagues that um, Ukraine planned to install, I think, around 30 gigawatt of renewables only to uh, provide uh, EU uh, with the green energy to produce hydrogen. EU is also seeking to produce uh, hydrogen uh, in uh, countries of uh, North Africa, uh, which, uh, which uh, shows that uh, there is new type of colonialism arising. So instead uh, of using the renewables in the countries to decarbonize their own uh, economy and society, uh, it will be used to produce uh, very um, energy um, energy intensive uh, fuel the hydrogen is. Um, have you been addressing this issue on a European level? Yes, and I think this is important for, for two reasons. Uh, one is the reason that you mentioned the, the sort of colonial perspective that rather than, than using domestically produced renewables as a way to support not only climate uh, transition in order to reduce emissions, but also reducing the energy bills for consumers uh, in Ukraine or in Poland, for, for example. But I, I also think we shouldn't underestimate the health issue. Uh, and I think we, as an environmental movement in general, I don't think that we have underplayed, or I mean overplayed, the climate perspective of fossil fuels, but I do think that we have underplayed the health issues 
Sometimes I believe that if we would have, we might have been more successful if we had put the health issues of fossil fuels first and then had the climate issue as a sort of nice bonus side effect. Given how, how damaging it is for health to live near uh, the, the production of, uh, of uh, production and, and burning of fossil fuels. Um, and I, I, I think it's, it's really unfortunate if countries, not only in, in Eastern Europe, but also in Africa, as you mentioned, that people would burn fossil fuels for their own domestic consumption, damaging their health, and then produce um, uh, renewable energy uh, for hydrogen wind is really inefficient uh, in terms of the transmission that you lose energy both in the production from a windmill towards hydrogen, but also using the hydrogen in then propulsing a, a car or a ship or a plane, that you lose a lot of energy. So um, I, I don't think that, that that is something that we should, we should uh, push for, um, having that hydrogen colonialism. Uh, we are uh, quickly running out of time, and I would uh, like to give our um, our uh, viewers um, also the opportunity to ask you some questions. So maybe um, the last thing, um, if you could summarize the green vision of um, European answer to the crisis uh, and to providing you with security, what would it be? I think it's it's being able to look at it short term, medium term and long term and having those issues aligned. I, I realize that in the short term, you cannot shut down coal power plants and, and, and fossil gas from one day to another. That is something that is just not possible politically or, or socially. But what we should do short term is expanding the renewables that are easy to deploy quickly, such as solar power, but not underestimating the enormous potential in energy efficiency, insulating the homes, heat pumps, changing the, the, the windows, and, and uh, trying to make sure that we're not wasting energy, uh, our refrigerators, TVs, and so on. There's so much we can do in reducing our energy consumption. And then not wasting euros in trying to expand the infrastructure for either coal or fossil gas, but instead looking long term to a future with 100% renewables and then aligning those, those targets, the short term targets, the mid term targets and the long term targets. Um, that is the most important role that we as Greens um, have, not only the uh, opportunity, but also the responsibility to, to advocate that. We but, but we mustn't okay. also forget the uh, social aspect of this. Even though the policy that I uh, propose might lead to, uh, at least in the short term, uh, increase of energy prices, I don't think that the best way to solve that is taking a part of the energy bill. It's much better to have direct income support to lower income citizens and then enabling that citizen to either pay that higher energy bill or doing your own local transition in insulating your home or doing something else. So that is a much better way. Support the individual themselves, not uh, a directed measure only towards the specific energy bill. That is uh, so much more um, inefficient. And not to support the uh, fossil fuel energy industry, industry at the same time. Um, yeah, I think we can sum it up that the best way to um, to fight Putin is to install a heat pump. So fight Putin with heat pumps. <laughs> um, I would like to uh, maybe use the I don't know five ten minutes that we we have five minutes that we have left um, to give the floor to our audience. So if there are any questions, uh, I think. We can move on to it. Mm -hmm. 
really, I can't see anyone. <laughs> there is oh, one. Yeah, there's a hand. Maybe it's more like a reflection. Uh, I'm Amir Smolinska, I'm an artist, a musician, cellist. <laughs> uh, I like this, um, this thing uh, you told about uh, making an order of health and then uh, about the climate in narration to, to people. And I wanted to say that I see uh, it's a lot of in, my, in our mind first when we are thinking about uh, any changes which are. And I feel like uh, because of the only architecture which we have have uh, uh, around us uh, every day. It's like we feel like uh, we're um, not near the nature and we can't feel like we're a part of it. And uh, changing it uh, could, could lead to, to a lot of changes uh, which is connected uh, with, with all the uh, uh, climate and, and uh, good nature, green uh, stuff. That's all, thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is... I, I fully agree. <laughs> so do I. Uh, hi, my name is Kuba Bilski. I have a question to you. Jakob, um, I wanted to ask, because as you said, hydrogen is um, not that um, cost effective. Well, it's not that energy efficient when we convert it um, from renewable energy. It's also problematic in the volume that it takes. Um, and recently, I think EU kind of diverged the funds from hydrogen vehicles to um, just developing, um, generating clean hydrogen. So I wanted to ask you, where do you think um, hydrogen um, technology is going? What do you think it might be used for in the future? Of course, it's still very much up in the air, but if you were to, to kind of speculate. So one clear use case for uh, hydrogen is the produ production of steel. In, in Sweden, we are now one of the first, if not the first, uh, pilot programs of producing steel without any carbon emissions whatsoever. Currently, steel production is 15% of Sweden's climate emissions from one single industry, steel. That is three times the emissions of aviation. I mean, we have this discussion of flygskam in, in Sweden, and uh, that I uh, understand that has uh, reached other countries as well, that you should uh, try to reduce emissions by not flying. Um, but uh, even more important is, of course, the steel industry, because that is three times the emissions. And hydrogen, from what I understand, is the only way of producing steel without any emissions. So that is, of course, a good use case. But there are other uh, use cases where you might be able to use hydrogen, uh, such as cars or trains, where I think battery is a much better um, method rather than hydrogen. And the way that I think that, that we should think about the production of, of hydrogen is if we really, how to say, over-invest in renewables, meaning that we, uh, we, 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 we dimension the production of renewables um, for more than we normally need, so that even when the sh sun shines only a little bit, or when the wind uh, blows a little bit, we still have enough of, of power because we have over-dimensioned the system. And then on those days when it uh, the wind is blowing really a lot, or the sun, or there are no cl clouds in the sky, and the sun is shining. Then we have a strong overproduction of renewables, and we, and which creates a really low price for energy. And then on those days, we use that oversupply to produce hydrogen. Um, then, then we solve many problems. Um, at once, I, I believe, so that we only produce hydrogen, uh, which is to some extent wasteful, but then we help the situation that we, we, we have the need to overdimension the renewables in order to make it work also on the days with reduced potential for using the renewables. 
Hello, Jacob. Eva Sufin here. I have a question concerning taxonomy. Uh, you lost uh, this, uh, this uh, vote in, um, in the European Parliament concerning gas and uh, nuclear and uh, tax European taxonomy. It was a very sad news for Poland also because uh, uh, we, were, we were happy that uh, photovoltaics were uh, for prosumers were so well progressing in Poland. We have already one million of prosumers with photovoltaics in Poland. We are the third country, so it's unbelievable. And so we, we were happy of this revolution. And now with this taxonomy and the war, we see uh, on one side the shale gas coming from the United States, and we have been very strongly involved in the fight against shale gas and fracking f a few years ago. And on the other side, we see the nuclear project progressing very quickly. So it, it, it's a very bad news. And do you, how do you imagine the next step for this taxonomy? There is nothing to do. Will it be another fight uh, in the parliament? Uh, how do you see it? Uh, thanks for that great question. We, we, we have limited availability now in the parliament. We, we just tried to stop it and we unfortunately failed. Um, but it's still po possible to stop it in the council. So if, if uh, we have uh, a good election result in, in, in the Polish elections next time, uh, maybe uh, the, with the Greens being part of a, a parliamentary majority forming the government or even being in the government, then that struggle can be um, even uh, a bit uh, easier. So uh, let's hope for uh, a strong uh, Polish uh, Green Party in the parliament and maybe in, even in the government. Okay, thank you very much. I believe we, we have run out of time. Uh, once again, thank you, Jakob, for uh, being here with us, and uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to our debate. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, thanks to you, Diana. And before you're finally allowed to go to lunch, we will show you, um, explain you briefly the uh, streams, the four that's going to happen, what are the topics, but it's only two and a half minutes and then you're off for lunch. So at 3.30, you're most welcome to one of the four streams. One is on the power of eco-feminism, one is on the cities, one is fighting um, the disinformation on uh, TikTok, and one is on the green ecological costs of the war in the Ukraine. So it's 3.30, 